Welcome to Beyond By Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond By Wings. In today's episode, we will be talking about the hygiene department of a dentistry. And to talk further on the subject matter, we actually have a special guest along with our regulars. Her name is Rachel Wall. She's the CEO and founder of Inspired Hygiene. She's been a hygienist for over three decades and running the operation Inspired Hygiene for 18 years. So hello, Rachel. How are you doing today? Hello, doing great. Thank you. Robert. I'm here. <laughs> As always. <laughs> awesome. So I think I honestly think today's episode is going to be a great one. How are you feeling today, Rachel? Feeling great. Hey, Rachel, tell us a little bit about what led you to start Inspired Hygiene. Oh, yeah. Great question. So I was working, you know, my first couple of hygiene jobs were very interesting and very different. The first practice that I worked in right out of hygiene school was in a very small town where I had gone to high school in Virginia. And it was kind of an old school practice. You know, there were two brothers-in-law and they kind of split the space. I was the one hygienist between the two of them. And, you know, they really didn't share anything about the business of the practice, right? We were just there to kind of do our job and get our paycheck. And the doctor would write the fee on the ledger card as, you know, the patient was exiting the operatory. And I didn't really even know what the fees were for the practice or anything about that. And then I decided to go back to school and I moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I went to school at UNC. And there, while I was getting my bachelor's degree in dental hygiene, I worked part-time in a dental office that was pretty much the total opposite of that. So while there were still a lot of great relationships with patients and within the team, this was kind of one of the enlightened practices, right, that had engaged in working with practice management consultants. It's it's actually funny, I'll, I'll, you know, one of the first consultants that they worked with was Deborah Nash. This was back in 1995, I think. And now Deborah lives up the street from me and we're friends. So it's kind of funny how Small things world. come full circle, right? It's yeah. It is a small world. And so, you know, in this practice, it was pretty much an open book. You know, we had goals as far as production. We were continually adding new services in the practice. The doctor would take us to high level CE, even if it was something that wasn't related to dental hygiene specifically, she would still invite everybody on the team to join along. And so I really appreciated learning about kind of the inner workings of the dental practice and and the the consultant that we were working at the time with at the time was really was really amazing with not only how can we contribute to the practice and how can the practice serve us and serve our patients, but also how can we develop ourselves, you know, to grow into individuals and professionals that are really making a contribution. And there was a lot of, I would say, mindset coaching and a lot of different things that really resonated with me as a young, you know, 20 something at the time. And so I had been working in dental hygiene for about seven years at that point. And I just decided, I thought, well, I went back to school because I knew at some point I would want to have something in addition to a clinical career. And so I left that practice and I went and worked at the dental faculty practice at UNC in the period department, just because I was looking for you know, diversity of experience. And, and that was a really interesting experience because I got to be involved with some of the early perio systemic research and things like that. So that was pretty cool. And then I became an assistant to that consultant that had worked in that practice. And so then she recommended me to a hygiene coaching group. And I worked with that group for a couple of years and then launched Inspired Hygiene in 2004. And so 
it's just been really great. I know, Robert, as you know, you do this, you do this with your clients to be able to see the results that teams can achieve when they really work together, they get on the same page, and they get really clear on what their vision and their mission is for the level of care that they're providing and also kind of what they what they want as providers and team members out of the practice. So it's been really fun to be able to be a part, a little tiny part of so many practices all over the country and to see kind of their, you know, their struggles and their triumphs. And what I've seen is, you know, they're, we're all more the same than we are different, right? There's thing, there's so many common themes, even in very different practices. And uh, so I've just been really grateful to have that opportunity to be involved in that. Well, and what would you say is the biggest challenge with getting a hygiene department working up to its full capabilities? Yeah, I would say really, I mean, with, you know, what we've seen the last couple of years with the pandemic aside. So if we put the staffing and some of those challenges aside, I would say in general, it really is, it really is getting the entire team to shift their mindset around, you know, I'm coming in and I'm letting the schedule kind of control me and what I do during the day. And instead think about, I'm a healthcare provider. I'm, I'm part of this patient's healthcare team. And so if I believe that about myself and about the work that we do, then I've got to show up a little differently and I've got to speak to the patients a little differently. And I've got to look at them from a different lens. So it's really that kind of mindset shift. And then once they make that mindset shift, then it is identifying what are the things that are standing in their way of really executing on that and delivering the level of care that they feel like their patients deserve. And sometimes that's scheduling issues. Sometimes it's some gaps, you know, some knowledge gaps within the rest of the team, you know, as far as maybe they have a treatment coordinator that could really use some coaching to be able to increase case acceptance. So it's identifying, you know, once they've kind of shifted their mind around, why am I here and what what am I here to do for my patients? Then it's, okay, how do we clear the path so that you can actually do that? And then in that, you know, magic way that it usually happens is that typically ends up creating a better even financial result for the practice and hopefully for the team as well. And how difficult is it for the hygienist to accomplish the right result without having the doctor really on board? I mean, is it possible that the hygienist can take the initiative and really make the hygiene department better without the doctor being the leader that they should be? I think it's very difficult. And And I would say, you know, most of the time when we engage with a practice, it's the doctor owner that's made that decision. And some doctors will consult with their team and some will say, this is this is what we're going to do. And we're here to support you, too. But we need you to be on board. Right. It's there. There's different levels of collaboration in that decision. But it's very, very difficult for the hygienists to make those changes and execute on that without the doctor being on board, because that's just going to create some natural resistance in multiple points. Well, I think you've heard me, I hesitate to use the word complain, but maybe talk. I think you've heard me talk about our clients a lot and how the majority of our clients' hygiene departments are underperforming. Mm -hmm. And and how do we fix that? I mean, is there an aha moment where we could show the doctor something that that he says, oh, yeah, I really do need some outside help because everybody knows consultants are expensive and Mm -hmm. is it really worth it? That's what I hear all the time. Well, oh, gosh, you know, this hygiene program is, you know, $15,000 over six months, and I just don't know if that's worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we, we work really hard to show our potential clients how they can get a a strong ROI on a consulting investment, and we use their specific data to show that. So I would say the best way to kind of get a doctor to have an aha and say, okay, maybe we need to consider this is, what is it, what what are they tolerating in, within the hygiene department or within the team that they feel like is holding back the progress of the practice, whether it's 
you know, they're difficult. They go in to do a hygiene exam and it's not consistent maybe between the hygienist. Maybe one is really great at teeing up treatment and having the photos ready, but the other isn't. And they've constantly got to do this dance of like, okay, what, which app am I going into and what do I need to be prepared to say? Right. Right. Instead of having, you know, consistency among their hygiene team so that they, whatever op they walk into, they know the photos are going to be up, the x-ray is going to be up, and the, the hygienist is going to have at least introduced, you know, some of these needs that the patient is experiencing from, you know, standpoint of their, their dental health. So there's some of that. Sometimes it's just frustrations on day to day and the workflow. Sometimes they've seen that the hygiene revenue has flatlined or decreased over several months and that will really get their attention, particularly from somebody like you who's looking at that in detail and saying, look, like this is a revenue stream within your business that you don't have to physically do this work. There's opportunity here to really empower your hygienist. And hey, by the way, you know, if you're willing to, it's also going to help them, you know, have some influence on their income. And that often is very attractive as long as it is in line with the clinical philosophy of patient care, right? And and, and so sometimes it is, turnover within the hygiene department, right? Maybe they had a staff that had been with them for a while. This is something we're seeing a lot now. Yeah, we've had a lot of that um, in the last few months. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, man, we were just kind of running like a top and now it's very awkward again. And our systems during the pandemic kind of went out the window, right? Maybe they were blocking their schedule and they had a really good hygiene exam flow and things are just chaotic and we need to get back to that, like, here's how we do things. Here's our standard of care and get everybody in agreement. So. I think, you know, when also maybe the hygienists don't have the same diagnostic philosophy of, you know, they'll walk into one op and the hygienist is saying, okay, I'm seeing bleeding, I'm seeing bone loss. And so, you know, doctor, can you confirm this patient has periodontal disease? And we've already talked about what the solution is for that versus walking into the other op and it's never even been mentioned. So that creates a lot of frustration that sometimes doctors just kind of deal with but it, they can build up resentment. It can slow down the flow of their day. It can hinder, you know, the profitability of the practice. So I think all of those things are trigger points very often. And I think, I think it just kind of depends on the individual practice owner of what is, what are they trying to achieve? And can this be a part of getting there? You know, and I think with a lot of our clients, it's not necessarily that the hygiene department revenue has decreased. It's just that they're young doctors, and so they've never experienced a hygiene department that was working together as well as yeah. they should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you preach or your book says that hygiene departments should produce about a third of total office production. And I would say the majority of our clients are in the lower 20% range, so may, maybe as much as a 10% deficit. And mm-hmm. um, they've just never experienced anything other than that, so they tend to accept that as, as the standard. Right, right. If you don't know any different, how what do you have to compare it to? Which is which is the beauty of working with an advisor like yourself, right? You've seen it all and you can give them some insight into what the industry standards are. So, yes, that is that is that is the ideal, that 30%. I will say, you know, it's interesting because when I started coaching and started Inspired Hygiene, I would say 20% of our clients were participating in some type of PPO plan and 80% were fee for service. And it's almost the exact opposite now. Yeah. I was just going to say those must've been the good old days. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. Wow. So, so it's, there are things that are absolutely challenging that three to one ratio, or let me take that back. There are things that are challenging that 30% hygiene, you know, production of total office. And also the next thing we'll get to is the three to one ratio. We'll talk about that from an industry standard, but those things are being challenged. Those benchmarks are being challenged because of the large percentage of practices that are, are now in network. And what we've seen over the last few years is a just almost across the board reduction in reimbursement in that regard. And so that's that's hurting that from a net production standpoint. The other thing that's happening at the same time is 
that a lot of GP doctors are bringing in more specialty type services, right? So they're placing implants, they're doing endo, they're doing sedation, they're doing, you know, all of these different services, which is fantastic. However, it makes it hard for hygiene to keep up at a production rate of 30% when a, you know, if they're, if they're primarily doing profies and bite wings, right. And and those reimbursement rates have been reduced and the doctors are adding higher, higher level and higher production procedures. It's hard for hygienists to get to that point. Right. So you really have to look at the whole big picture to, to really figure out, okay, what is realistic, right. In this particular practice. And then the three to one is another benchmark that's been pretty accepted across the industry for the last, I don't know, I'd say 20 years where, Hygiene contributes profit to the practice once they are producing three times their compensation. Well, and that's a question I have with these days. We're seeing hygienists that are, you know, two years ago, most of them were making forty, forty two dollars right. an hour. Now they're making fifty dollars an hour. Is it still realistic yeah. to expect them to right. produce three times what they're being paid? Right. I think, it again, it just depends on the practice. It probably is not realistic to hit that three to one if you're in if you're if you're even participating at a moderate level. Right. In some of these low reimbursing plans. Right. If you've got 50 percent of your patient base that's in some type of PPO network, it, that might not be realistic. And I actually just spoke with a, a doctor owner that has several locations in the south and their model is. You know, they're they're very inclusive. They take 300 different plans. And and he said to me, he's like, look, I know that three to one is the industry standard. He said, but I would be I would be happy if we could get to two point five and I'd even give my hygienist, you know, some percentage of whatever the overage was. So at least he had a realistic expectation of what could be produced in that environment. And he said, that's this is our model. This is not something that we're going to change anytime soon. So we've got to adjust our expectations mm. accordingly. And, you know, if you're at two to one, then you're just breaking even. You're basically hygiene is, you know, the, the production of hygiene is paying for compensation and the overhead, yeah, right? overhead the of the practice, the right? Polish. Yeah. Things yeah. like that, but it's not driving any profit to no the profit. practice right. outside of strictly, we're talking strictly from hygiene production, right? Right. So, yeah, the, all of those numbers are being challenged right now, for sure. And is it more of a challenge when you have a doctor that thinks they're better off doing their own hygiene? Well, certainly that's a challenge for us because if they don't have <laughs> in their practice, then what are we going to do? No, we, we have helped some doctors like hire and establish a perio pro, I'm sorry, a hygiene program in their practice. And, and the way we typically come at that is, does it make sense for you, doctor, to spend your time doing these procedures when you could be doing these much higher level procedures? I, I don't know. I, I mean, there are a lot of doctors doing hygiene right now because of the staffing issues, but I don't think that's the best use of their time, personally. Well, and, and it's not just the absence of having a warm body there to do hygiene. Sometimes it's, it's you know, the salaries have gone up so much, they're thinking, well, it, I'm just better yes. off doing it myself. And I don't agree with that, and I know you I don't, don't either. but we see a lot more of that today than we ever have. Yeah, but I mean, if you're looking at, and it depends on the area where you are, right? But if you're looking at fifty to sixty dollars an hour, I get it. If you're getting reimbursed seventy dollars for a profi, that that doesn't that doesn't match up. What I would say is instead of using the doctor's time to do those procedures, how can you find a great hygienist and really empower and train them to be able to tee up treatment for you and build your schedule? where you're going to be producing, you know, hundreds of dollars per hour instead of 70 or, you know, $80 per hour or 70 or $80 per 30 minutes. Cause that's typically what's happening is when the doctors are seeing, you know, hygiene patients are seeing them for a very short period of time. Um, and maybe they have the assistants taking x-rays and things like that. But I, I feel like, yes, it might, it's the path of least resistance might be, well, I'll just do it myself. I, I agree. And, and you had a great question there. You said, how can I find a hygienist that does, you know, the, the type of work that needs to be done? Well, do you have any advice on that? How can these people, because we have a lot of clients that say, I just can't find a hygienist. What should mm-hmm. they be doing? Where should they be looking? Uh, mm-hmm. Is that something you can help them with? I mean, tell me about it. 
Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. That is a question that we've been getting a lot. And I will say from our experience working with practices all over the country is it's you've got to try multiple avenues, right? I would say we just spoke with somebody yesterday that found had found multiple hygienists through Indeed. And then a month ago, we were talking to another practice and they said, I've gotten nothing from Indeed. And I had great experience from Dental Post, for example. So I think you've got to understand that just like with anything, you've got to have multiple, you know, I'm going to use a fishing analogy. I don't use, I don't fish, but you've got to have multiple lines in the water, right? Don't just depend on one avenue to find that, that person. So empower your team. I'll tell you something I saw recently. This was not a client of ours, but it was someone in my local area. I live in Charlotte and I, cause I'm still a licensed hygienist in North Carolina. I got a postcard and it was a beautiful postcard. And it talked about the mission of the practice and had team photos. It had a QR code on the back of the postcard and you scanned it. And it went to a web page that had testimonials from their team about how great it was to work there. It's like, you know, they're really thinking outside the box and I'm sure they work with a great marketing company that helped them do that. But you, you've got to put a lot of lines in the water from networking you know, making friends and getting acquainted with the the people that work at the, the hygiene schools, whether they're in your area or whether they're two hours away, you know, making sure that you are highlighting all the things that are really unique and valuable to your practice. We were working with a practice not long ago that has a model where they take off every six weeks, their office is closed for a week. Wow. So this team gets a lot of time off. And they had not even thought to put that in the ad. I was like, you guys, this is huge. Like this is, this is a big selling point. You got to make sure you have that in your ad. No kidding. Um, Yes. Yeah. So make sure, ask your team, like what's great about working here? Because maybe there's some perks that you don't really think about because it's just, you know, how you operate, but they might say, you know what? We just, our technology always works. We always have the best instruments. You know, you always support us. You buy us lunch on Fridays, you know, when we work Friday morning, whatever it might be, you know, and just highlight those things and get that out there in the community, get it out on your social media. You know, you never know who might know someone and then use multiple avenues as far as, you know, places to to put your ad. And then for some of our clients, we've even developed a, a slide deck that kind of highlights some specific things about their practice that they can again, share, let's say they get an inquiry, they can share that, you know, via email and say, Hey, take a look at this. And, you know, we'd love to have the opportunity to to speak with you. And it kind of highlights what's great about the practice. So I would say just work with your team really and get creative to, to figure out how can we really position this as a great place to work. Well, and I realize you're in Charlotte, so you're on the East Coast. And how can you work with clients throughout the rest of the country? Do you? And, and, and if so, logistically, how does that work? We absolutely do. We actually, as of today, we have worked with clients in 45 states. And Congratulations. So thank, you. thank you. Yeah, we have had we have coaches that live um, all over the country and they are all hygienists and they are all trained in the inspired hygiene way. And so some of our work is done virtually and some of it is done on site. So, for example, we do a hygiene analysis. We call it the hygiene growth roadmap. And it really digs deep into multiple systems in the hygiene department and really gives the practice owner specific actionable steps to address things that can help generate growth in a in the short term, like simple things they can do with their team in the first 30 days, and then some longer term, you know, action steps to create that roadmap to, to that growth. And that growth doesn't necessarily mean more volume of patients. It could be, hey, we want to grow our verbal skills to increase case acceptance, or we want to grow you know, our efficiency and scheduling or whatever it might be. But that is all that service. The roadmap is all done virtually. We do virtual chart audit. We do a virtual scheduling audit. And then we look at some of the client's data and really put together a nice report and a a presentation for them on that. And then and then when they're ready for coaching, one of our coaches goes out and is in their office for two or three days. And really that way they can see, you know, it's amazing what you see when you're in there versus what you hear over the phone is you really get to see like, oh, I see what's holding them back from this. It's because, you know, they, they're trying to do a, a presentation to the client, but they don't have anywhere to sit the patient. So 
Can we help them kind of overcome some of those obstacles that might not be so obvious when you're working virtually? And then we do the follow up accountability and support coaching through Zoom. So it's really a combination of on site and, you know, virtual support. Well, and we're kind of coming to the end of this episode, but I want to ask you another question about something you just said, talking about the hygiene growth map. Is is this something that you offer for free or is there a charge? And if the charge, how much is it and how do they get in touch with you? So thank you for asking that, Robert. That's a great question. Yes. So the the hygiene growth roadmap is an investment of $2,100 typically. And what we're offering for your listeners is a special offer of $300 off. So just go to our website or you can email us at clients at inspiredhygiene.com. And we would be happy to honor that. And um, the promo code for that is Edwards 300. So uh, maybe we'll get you guys a link that you could put uh, with the show notes, if that's possible, that goes to that kind of description or the page for the the hygiene growth roadmap so everybody can kind of see what that's about. But yeah, essentially it just offers an audit of several systems within the hygiene department and those specific action steps that I mentioned. And then what we do is if that if that client chooses to go into coaching within 45 days of us doing the review, then we apply that whole amount to their coaching investment. And then the other thing that we do is if we don't identify at least $100,000 in realistic, practical growth in the hygiene department through that roadmap, then we'll refund the investment. So that's kind of our guarantee on that hygiene growth right. roadmap. But that's yeah, outstanding. Would happy, yeah, I would happy, be happy to share that with anybody and be able to help you see really what's possible. Outstanding. We appreciate that. And Absolutely. I appreciate you being on today for imparting all the information to our clients and other listeners. Thank you My very pleasure. much. Thanks for the invite. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much again, Rachel, for being on our show. It was a pleasure. For our listeners out there that are interested to know more about today's episode or basically about any subject matter, please feel free to reach us at info at eandassociates.com. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond by Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more information, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.